World News Today. Brought to you by Admiral Corporation, world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers. This program is presented in behalf of Admiral dealers all over America. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers in our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Robert Trout. President Truman is leading the nation in giving thanks for the victory. While Americans all over the country observed the day of prayer, each according to his custom, special services were conducted in the East Room of the White House by the chiefs of chaplains of the Army and Navy. And the congregation of 200 military, government, and congressional leaders prayed for wisdom and strength with which to face the hard tasks of peace. Across the sea, Great Britain observed the day of prayer, too. The king and queen drove through the city of London to the services at St. Paul's Cathedral, which stands triumphant amid blocks of wreckage and rubble. The Japanese representatives are now in Manila, where they arrived slightly ahead of schedule after a swift flight in an American plane from Ie Shima. Sixteen Japanese stepped out of the plane at Nichols Field, although General MacArthur instructed the enemy to send four men, one a representative of the emperor and three advisors. It is not clear just which of the 16 Japanese is representing the emperor. The party consists of eight army and air force officers, six naval officers, and two civilians. They have come to meet General MacArthur several days later than he had told them to come. They took off from Japan last night, flying from a different airfield than the one General MacArthur had instructed them to use. So far, there's been no report of any meeting between the 16 Japanese and General MacArthur, although the emissaries have been interviewed by American staff officers. It is to be expected that when the Supreme Allied Commander at last comes face to face with the representatives of the enemy, he will put an end, as far as he is able, to the farce of Japanese delay, postponement, and deliberate misunderstanding of instructions. But there is a limit to General MacArthur's power. This morning, the military correspondent of the New York Times, Hanson Baldwin, points out that the general is at least mildly handicapped. Mr. Baldwin says that General MacArthur exhibited too much patience at the beginning. But the fact is, before Japan has actually surrendered, the United States has been psychologically disarmed behind the general's back. And, he says, America's rushing pell-mell into peace and beginning reconversion and demobilization even before the Japanese have been disarmed must have caused delight in Tokyo. A bit later, we shall hear more details of the surrender meeting from our Columbia correspondent in Manila. Meanwhile, it may be worth pointing out once again that Japan has not yet surrendered. Technically, the situation is as it was last Tuesday evening, when the President and the Prime Minister announced that Japan had agreed to accept surrender under the terms of the Potsdam Ultimatum. There will be no surrender during this meeting at Manila. It is not yet known where or when the surrender will take place. To arrange those details is the purpose of the Manila meeting, and it is likely to be some days yet before the Japanese sign the document which will formally end the war. What is perfectly clear is that in these days preceding the surrender, Japan is energetically jockeying for position in the post-war world. Broadcasts and dispatches from Tokyo hour after hour during these strange days, tell of the methods by which Japan is organizing for the days to come, using this time to make ready for the trial of occupation. Perhaps there's no single answer to the question which is now heard everywhere in the United States, why are the Japanese pursuing these tactics of delay? It may be that that question has several answers. Perhaps the enemy is stunned and shocked, partly paralyzed for the moment, unable to act efficiently. But also, there can be little doubt that the enemy does have a purpose to humiliate the Allies and to create the impression of an unbeaten Japan, ending the Japanese dealt to CBS Manila, John Adams reporting. Three hours after Japan's peace emissaries landed at Nichols Field, they met with members of General MacArthur's staff to provide and receive information to facilitate the entry of the Supreme Commander and his accompanying forces into Japan. No time was lost. The period of stalling and exchange of messages on procedure 
which have bogged down negotiations for the past four days, seemed at an end. At 9 p.m. tonight, 14 hours after they left Tokyo, Lieutenant General Takashiro Kawabe, Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and members of his surrender party were ushered into the offices of Lieutenant General Richard K. Sutherland, MacArthur's Chief of Staff, and offered their credentials. Five minutes later, they filed up to the third floor office of Major General Stephen J. Chamberlain, Assistant Chief of Staff, G-3. Took seats at a long black table opposite U.S. Army and Navy representatives and were directed to provide the necessary information. Just what that information is has not been disclosed by the Supreme Commander. But tonight, much of that information is already in the hands of General MacArthur's staff, and plans are no doubt being rushed to conclude the discussions and get on to the next step, the return of the Jap envoys to Tokyo, and the final preparations for the formal signing of the surrender documents, which should take place before the end of the week, either in Tokyo or Tokyo Bay. For the past several days, American and Allied officials have been gathering in Manila, representatives of the Australian Army, Lord Mountbatten's staff, the Chinese government, the U.S. military mission, and at this moment, various Russian military leaders are expected in the first direct flight from Vladivostok to Manila via Iwashima or Okinawa. They, like General MacArthur and his staff, and some 10 million GIs that are still in uniform, are getting impatient and wondering just how soon the surrender will be official and we can get into the post-war phase of occupation. Some feel we have lost much valuable time already these past 10 days since Hirohito's initial offer of surrender. The delays, they feel, represent a political victory for the Japs, or at least for Hirohito. They have had ten days to condition their people and soften the sting and stigma of defeat. They have been able to figure out their own post-war policy. They have had a chance to burn their papers and to hide their gold and treasures and looted wealth. This is John Adams in Manila. I return you to CBS. Out at Admiral Nimitz headquarters today, the men who plan amphibious operations are getting set for a peacetime landing on Japan. A Columbia correspondent has recorded the scene on Guam, and for his report, here is Bill Downs. We're sweating out another D-Day here in the Pacific, the most peculiar D-Day of the whole war. This occupation move on Japan has taken all, on all the aspects of a full-scale combat landing. The men are keyed up, the convoys are on the move, and more are assembling. The Air Force is waiting to play its role in the show. Tempers are getting short, and the usual D-Day restlessness is in evidence everywhere. There are many things that make this peacetime D-Day, like many others that have happened before the peace was on. In the first place, there's the uncertainty. No one knows exactly what is going to happen. And it's the same old story of being crowded onto a ship. Only this time, there are not quite the same number of anxiety complexes in evidence. And the men know that when they get to their destinations in Japan, that the living probably will be the same tough field conditions that they've had all through the Pacific campaign. I've talked with a number of men slated for the occupation of Japan, and next to the primary question of whether they're going to be shot at or not, there's the question of what they're going to do when they get there. And if you know a soldier's mind, you'll know what I mean. Yeah, that's right, fraternization. I saw the non-fraternization policy fail in Germany. From completely unofficial sources, I understand that a similar non-fraternization policy is contemplated for Japan. But there is a difference. No G.I. is going to fraternize with a little lotus blossom when lotus blossom might have a knife in her hand. And the G.I.s know that the fanaticism of the Jap from a way back. But a soldier is still a soldier, and an American soldier, believe me, is even more so. Sooner or later, there very definitely will be a fraternization problem in Japan. The people of Japan are getting desperately hungry. The American Army will have more food per man than the Jap ration ever contained in the best of times. The G.I. is naturally a friendly animal, and he's going to come to like the children of Japan, and nothing can stop that. In other words, the American soldier is a human being. He's going to suffer when he sees suffering, 
and he's going to sympathize with any people in distress. He's also going to remember the Jap atrocities and the pal that was killed on one of these island campaigns, and he's going to be a frustrated person for a while. But in the end, the G.I. is going to be a human being, and when he lives with the suffering that Japan has brought upon herself, he's going to feel sorry. There's nothing that can be done about that either. That was Bill Downs on Guam. We return you now to Admiral in New York. Next, a word from Warren Sweeney. Admiral Corporation adds its voice to the prayer of thanksgiving going up to an almighty providence all over the nation today. Admiral's devout hope is for the safe return of our millions of sons and daughters all over the world and for our ability to offer them the employment and happiness they so richly deserve. May the peace which has so suddenly descended upon us be an everlasting one. May the post-war world, of which we have dreamed so long, and of which we have now emerged, be one of peace and prosperity for every race, color, and creed. Now here once again is Robert Trott. In Washington today, President Truman attended special prayer services. For details, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Tris Coffin reporting. President Harry Truman led the nation in prayer at special services today in the White House. He sat tight-lipped and grave throughout the nearly hour-long services. The president stared straight ahead at the altar with its gold cross and two lighted gleaming candlesticks. Shafts of sunlight came through the long windows fliced on the sparkling chandeliers and glanced off the cross. The faces in this room, the famous East Room, are known to the world. The Cabinet, Supreme Court, Military and Naval High Command, leaders of Congress. Mrs. Woodrow Wilson, widow of the man who saw another war begin and end, was present. The services opened with a hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, followed by the 103rd Psalm, The Lord is Merciful and Gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. A mixed choir of service men and women sang the recessional. The soloist, a slender red-haired wax, sang, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, in a high, tender voice. Through the strange chemistry of emotion, all of us in that room, great and small, were united in humility and faith and hope. The chaplain read the litany of thanksgiving, for the lives in every land that have been preserved for thy service, among ourselves and among our enemies. Then the voices welled up, We thank thee, O God. In that chorus were the tones of a president and a marine private and a justice of the Supreme Court. The chaplain went on, For the countless acts of service performed by men, women, and children, who without thought of fame or reward have helped their fellow men. And again, We thank thee, O Lord. The chaplain facing the altar began his prayer, and his words filled the room. We bow our heads to give thee thanks for giving us the means to subdue evil. Remember all those who have suffered. Restore the oppressed. Heal the wounded. May we be worthy of their sacrifices. Grant us the courage for peace and brotherhood. Bring dignity and worth to every member of the human race. Put away hatred. Grant all equal opportunity. Give us courage for peace. God, give us faith when the way is long and hard. President Truman sat lost in his thoughts. He was perfectly still, a dignified, gray-haired man with a firm chin. Sitting quietly and humbly in the back row was General of the Army George Marshall. He sat motionless. The closing hymn was America. Every voice joined prayerfully. Long may our land be bright. I return you to Admiral in New York. Now for the news from Great Britain. Admiral takes you to London, Charles Collingwood reporting. On this Sunday, Britain observed a nationwide day of prayer and thanksgiving for victory. All over the country, people went to church to worship on the first Sunday of peace in almost six years. To London's great cathedral of St. Paul, miraculously spared in the Blitz, went the king and queen and the princesses. The royal carriage, drawn by white horses, made its way through London streets to the cathedral. The cheering crowds were officially admonished not to throw paper from windows, since the royal horses, although trained for crowds, 
We're not used to the new American method of celebrating by throwing pieces of paper. At the cathedral, the royal party were greeted by the Lord Mayor in his robes. And to a fanfare from silver trumpets, they entered the cathedral with the Archbishop of Canterbury. To the crowds outside who had just voted a socialist government into office, the age-old ceremony was strangely satisfying. The war had been won, and England was still England. The British are looking with considerable envy at what appears to them to be the United States' rapid transition from war to peace conditions. While gasoline is taken off the ration in America, the British are granted another gallon a month. While America talks of ending meat rationing, British food rations take a further cut. As America predicts the end of rationing for shoes, the British are told their clothing ration will be still further paired. There's nothing new in this continuance of controls. If Churchill's government had stayed in office, they would have done much the same thing. And people were pretty much reconciled to it and said to themselves that Britain being a small group of islands and all that, they could see how it was the best way. But now that the war is actually over, and other countries, particularly America, are bursting the bonds of wartime restrictions, the British are beginning to get a little restive. They probably have more self-control than most people, but they like a good meal as well as anybody else, and they don't object to taking the car out of the garage and going for a drive. This natural sentiment is, of course, jumped on by the conservative press, which is most of the press in Britain, and there are many dire forebodings in the papers of Lord Beaverbrook and the other press lords. Controls which stay too long, says Beaverbrook's Daily Express darkly, breed corruption in high poor peasants than any other of the victorious nations except Russia. This is Charles Collingwood in London, returning you to Admiral in New York. The Chinese capital, and indeed all the Allies, received the good news today that Lieutenant General Wainwright and other prisoners of the Japs have been liberated. For details, Admiral takes you to Chungking, Don Pryor reporting. General Jonathan P. Skinny Wainwright, the hero of the town of Kawagador, is in a Japanese prison camp about 100 miles northwest of Lipton, Manchuria, and apparently is safe and well. That report came today from General Wedemeyer, China Theater Commander, and a radio message from American volunteers who parachuted into a prison camp at Lipton itself. They were told by a Japanese colonel about Wainwright, and an American major set out to make contact with him. There is no report here so far that he has been liberated. The report said the prisoners in the McDill camp were in good health for the most part, but that supplies of food were needed. General Wenemeyer said that Wainwright would be evacuated by air and probably would be in Chongqing within a day or two. The news about General Wainwright resulted from one phase of a vast rescue operation extending from Korea and Manchuria to Indochina. Already, volunteer doctors, signal call men, and supplies have been parachuted to allied prisoners of war and civilian internees in four camps in Korea, in Manchuria, at Hoysin in northeastern China, and at Peiping. Out of 1,673 in the Mukden camp, 1,321 are American. And the camp leader is Major General G.M. Parker, an American. The report said that only 34 prisoners are in the camp where General Wainwright was located at Xi'an, and only eight of those are Americans. The Japanese colonel in charge of both camps apparently gave the Americans detailed information. At Wei Xin, Chinese troops in there said, are on guard in the area nearby while Japanese control the prison wall. At Peiping, the Japanese general in command claimed that since the war was not yet over officially, he would not have to, he would have to get permission from Man King before permitting the Americans to see the prisoners. Meanwhile, they were allowed to send in cigarettes and supplies and to radio back to headquarters here. Hospital ships, meanwhile, have been asked to put in at Chinese ports to help evacuate the live prisoners as they are brought out by plane. There are about 20,000 war prisoners and 15,000 Occidental internees in the China theater. This is Don Pryor and Chung King. I return you to Admiral. 
the all treacherous attack that drove us into war, and also to avenge Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, the first American soil to feel the treachery of the enemy, had been skeptical of all peace talk. The people here had memories running back to that December morning. They wouldn't believe the rumors until the official word was flashed. And when the president announced the enemy had surrendered at last, everybody went completely wild. From the highest-ranking admiral to the seaman second class, the Navy let off long pent-up steam. Whistles on the huge great battleships and carriers keynoted the impromptu celebration. And sailors and waves dashed about singing, shouting, making as much noise as they could. At night, the ships lighted up. Pearl Harbor on the night of the Japanese surrender was an unforgettable year. We run into suntan Navy men who keep saying, Well, now, maybe we'll get home for Christmas. It wasn't like that before. The people here counted on a long, bloody struggle to last many more months bec before they could start thinking of civilian life again. They remembered Pearl Harbor. They recalled vividly the destruction fired from the skies that Sunday morning and the years necessary since to cure this ailing giant naval base. The picture has changed. Pearl Harbor, fully recovered from that disastrous morning, is more powerful than ever. It has rebuilt, expanded, enlarged. It has directed the attack against the enemy to final victory. No wonder the people here have only now begun talking eagerly about home, their families, about taking up where they left over yet. Shooting and the dying may, st may have stopped, but the Navy's countless problems of service and supply continue. That was Morton Stone at Pearl Harbor. We return you to Admiral in New York. Here in New York, the Russian communique is just coming in, and it says that Japanese troops have ceased resistance in most parts of Manchuria and are now surrendering in increasing numbers. Tonight's communique says that more than 55,000 Japanese troops were herded into Russian prisoner of war camps today. Previously, the Russians had announced some 25,000 enemy troops had given up in Manchuria. The Moscow Pravda, the organ of the Soviet Communist Party, charges today the Japanese leaders are attempting to disavow their war guilt while they are secretly planning to gain revenge. Pravda says Japanese imperialists want to convince the people that this defeat by no means signifies the complete failure of their imperialistic program. Furthermore, Japanese ruling circles attempt to exploit a situation for the consolidation of the reactionary moral and political foundations on which rests the entire edifice of Japanese imperialism. That's what Pravda says today. And now, here once again is Warren Sweeney. One of America's most urgent manpower needs is for more experienced officers and men with certificates for all merchant marines. Even with the war in the Pacific over... The task of supplying and bringing home our men still lies before us. America has the ships, but she still needs the men to man them. If you have experience needed to serve your country in this emergency, apply at once by wiring Collect, Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, and post-war makers of Admiral Dual Temp Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings...